Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is the Church and we're in the final section of this teaching in which we talk about the Holy Spirit and the Church. We could not exist without the Holy Spirit. The Church has been called to life by the Holy Spirit and we depend on the Holy Spirit for everything. In this program we're going to see how the Holy Spirit is working in the church to draw us together and to bring us to full maturity in Christ. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of unity and so in these days as the Holy Spirit's working in our lives we are more and more conscious that every believer in Christ is one with Christ and therefore one with each other. We're looking forward to the unity of the Spirit in the Church of Jesus Christ. First of all, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith. The Church of Jesus Christ is going to be one. Jesus' prayer is going to be answered. I pray that they may be one even as we are one. That doesn't mean to say that we're all going to be the same because Jesus is not the same as the Father. He shares the same nature, but he's also different from the Father. He is not the Father, he is the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Father is the Father, and the Son is the Son. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father. They're different, but they're also one. They're one in nature, they're one in purpose, they're one in function. You can't see who gets the glory in the Godhead. The Father dumps it on the Son, Son dumps it on the Father, the Spirit dumps it on the Father and the Son. They're all dumping the glory. And we need to be dumpers of glory, not attractors of glory to ourselves. We need to understand that this unity message of Jesus is absolutely essential for maturity. Think about it. Why is it that there are so many divisions within the body of Christ? Immaturity, children falling out with each other, kids I'm not like, like talking about children of God. Children of God is a mature image. I'm talking about kids. Kids. Immaturity. Nothing to do with Jesus Christ. But the time is coming when we'll, we'll, we will reach the unity of the faith. Now this is not the unity of the Spirit. The unity of the Spirit exists already. And what we have to do is to maintain the unity of the Spirit. This is the unity of the faith. This is unity in all essential matters. This means that we are working together, that we are living together and sharing together. And uh, we need to know that, of course, unity in the faith doesn't mean that everybody one day is going to believe exactly the same thing about everyone. It's not just unity in doctrine. We will be united in all of the principal doctrines, I believe that. Because how can we be one in the body unless we can't, if we can't even agree what it takes to be in the body? If we can't even agree on, on what a Christian initiation is, if we can't agree amongst the professing Christian body what it means to be a Christian, how can we even show oneness and unity to the world? So some of these doctrines like repentance and faith and water baptism and baptism in the Holy Spirit, the divinity of Jesus Christ, who he is, his atonement, his work on the cross, in fact, all those things that Paul mentions in the earlier part of Ephesians chapter 4, one body, one faith, one baptism, and all these things, the church will be at one in these areas. But there will be room for differences about, uh, to do with the things which are not central, the, the, the things which are peripheral, because God is not concerned about everybody believing exactly the same thing, and indeed the diversity of belief amongst the body of Christ, when it's talking about non-essential things, enhances our unity, because God can then reflect various aspects about himself through different groups. There's not one group that reflects all the truth of God, but the time is coming when the church of Jesus Christ will centrally 
uh, on, the, on the centralities of the faith, on the essentials of the faith, we will hold to the same thing. And we will understand that because the Spirit will bring us to maturity of understanding in the things of the Spirit. That will happen on planet Earth before Jesus returns. And we need to be aware of that because it could well be in our generation. God is calling us to work towards this, and it could well be. Nobody can predict this for sure. Many signs point in this direction. It could well be that we are the last generation ever to live on this earth. Jesus could well come within our lifetime, and maybe much sooner than that. And so we need to take this agenda seriously. And what I'm calling you to do, all of those who follow the Sword of the Spirit series, become part of the building of the church of Jesus Christ. If you want to get involved in what Jesus is doing, ask him what he's doing. He says, I will build my church. That's what I'm doing. What do we, what do, we do, Lord? He says, you go and make disciples of all nations. What's that? Building the church. Building the church. Grow up in your individual maturity. Grow up in your corporate maturity. Grow up in your understanding. Join together with fellow believers. Do not let denominations become barriers. Share, but we must share in the truth of Jesus Christ. I do not believe in the ecumenical movement. They're going about it the wrong way. They're trying to construct unity, and they're, they're watering the doctrine down, and it's, this, it's, the, it's the line of least resistance. And I don't believe that we should do that. We should hold to the gospel. There can only be gospel unity. We can't have this unity apart from the cross of Christ, apart from the word of Jesus Christ, apart from the Holy Spirit. But the time is coming when the Holy Spirit would have worked so that we all see Jesus and we come together in that strong unity. Then he says also in verse 13, to we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God. To the knowledge of the Son of God. The word knowledge is gnosko in the Greek. Gnosko. But here the word knowledge is a special word. It has also the intensifying prefix of epi. So the word for knowledge here is epignosko. Epignosko. Gnosko means knowledge. Epignosko means full knowledge. Also, gnosko here is not just something that you know with your mind. It's not talking about intellectual knowledge. It's talking about deep, experiential, practical knowledge. And so when we come to know God, we know him in our experience. And that knowledge is expressed practically in our lives. The knowledge of God is the acknowledgement of God in our lives. The knowledge of Jesus is to know him personally and intimately and practically and experientially so that his life becomes our life and that life becomes visible to the world. Now, here the Apostle Paul says there is coming a day when we will all enter into the full knowledge of Jesus. Every member of the body of Christ will know Jesus fully. Will come into the full knowledge, not just this partial, partial knowledge. And by full knowledge, it must mean as full as is possible to know him on the earth. It doesn't mean the fullness of eternity. But there is a fullness of knowledge now that he wants us to enter into. And when you think, and the Apostle Paul describes this in Philippians chapter 3, when you think that the Apostle Paul coming very much to the end of his life, or at least certainly right the way there as a mature apostle, he says, I want to know him. All that I've experienced, all that I have, I, I reject. I want to know him. And here we have the apostle Paul, who by that time was responsible for writing so many epistles, and by the time he finished his ministry, writing two-thirds of the New Testament, here we have this man well into his ministry as one of the greatest apostles, probably the greatest apostle alongside the apostle Peter. And here he says, all I want is to know him. I want to enter into this knowledge of Christ. And so here we are talking about the whole church coming to know Jesus like the apostle Paul knew Jesus till we all come to the full knowledge of the faith. This is going to be a glorious end time church. The Holy Spirit will be so powerfully working that, and revealing Jesus to us that we will be walking in the full knowledge of Jesus Christ as the church. Powerful. 
Aren't you inspired by this? Don't you want to live for such a goal? Don't you want to sacrifice all your own earthly ambitions that you might be part of God's great business to be building the church outward and upward? Yes? Well, there's more to come. There's more to come. Going on also in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, it goes on in verse 13 to speak about that we should come, all come to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The measure of the stature. Here, we're coming to a maturity, a maturity so that we come to the measure of the stature of Christ. In other words, we will walk around with the maturity of Christ himself. That's amazing. That means the church will not be any longer the baby church or the adolescent church, and certainly not the old, weak, decrepit church. The church of Jesus Christ will be the mature, vibrant, powerful, strong church that speaks of the full manhood of Jesus Christ. What a powerful revelation that's coming to us. And in this way, our maturity will produce all the results that come from maturity. Just think about it like this. God has set his love upon humanity. And God has, by his divine decree of election, called out of the world a body that shall be his people. That means that before Jesus returns, everyone who is going to be saved will be saved. And that body will be complete. And on the earth, there will be a body of Christ capable of fulfilling the Great Commission. We will get the job done. Because if we don't, nobody else will. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached shall be preached, will be preached in all the nations of the world as a witness, and then the end shall come. In other words, for all those to be saved who are going to be saved, the gospel has to be preached. How widely? Everywhere, my friends, everywhere. Because the apostle John in his vision, which he records in the book of Revelation, says... I saw people from every kindred, every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. As I say these words right now, all over the world, one quarter of this world does not know Jesus. Forty percent doesn't know Jesus. But one quarter of the world doesn't have the opportunity even to hear about Jesus. Most of these people live in what we call the 1040 window, 10 degrees uh, latitude north of the equator and 40 degrees. The 1040 window, which includes most of the world's poor, most of the world's uh, who've never heard about Jesus. And they are culturally and geographically excluded from the gospel. And so it takes a mature church that will pay the price to go and communicate Christ cross-culturally. And that would sacrifice. I've seen visions of this in the spirit, of what's going to happen to us. I've seen visions in the spirit. I know what I'm talking about. We are moving very soon into a new phase in the life and ministry of London City Church. The first great goal was to build and to see in London a London City Church capable of impacting this, this city as a whole, and also capable of reaching out to the nations of the world. We are reaching out to the nations of the world through our evangelistic programs, our missions programs, and through the general travel of so many of our international members. And we have 110 different nationalities in our church, in a single congregation in the central church, let alone right across the entire network. And so we are touching the world. We are impacting the world through these videos, these training sessions, and through these broadcasts. We are impacting the world, but not yet as God wants us to. My great passion is to send out scores and scores of people into the unevangelized areas of the world so that the body of Christ may be built up, 
so that we might be a mature church of, and see those people who are going to be saved, to see them saved. And some of these don't speak our language. Some of these don't dress the way I dress or the way you dress. Some of them dress in strange clothes. I've seen them in a vision. They came to me in a vision rather like tropical fish. With all those, have you seen some of those tropical fish? They're glorious. Have you seen that long, thin fish that when it looks at you this way, you can't see it? When it looks at that way, you see it that big? And stripes and those beautiful, angelic-like fins. Have you seen those fish? Have you seen those glorious tropical fish with all their dapples, all their colors, all the colors of the rainbow? God really had fun when he created tropical fish. That's how I would dress if I was allowed to. <laughs> and God spoke to me and said, these are those, these are those of my people that I have. And you've got to reach them. And then I saw these people with strange clothes, the way I'd like to dress sometimes. All these colorful clothes, exotic clothes, all these great, beautiful cultures that have to be redeemed for the gospel. And then I saw people from the church going to minister and to reach the gospel. And right now as I speak, they are seeing visions of people coming. They are meeting in their council chambers and saying amongst the elders, what is it that the wise women are dreaming? They are dreaming dreams and seeing strange faces. People of strange clothing come and talk to us about a message of life. And when we go and preach to them, they're going to say, we know who you are. We've been expecting you. We've seen your face in a vision. I want to tell you, my friends, this is exciting stuff to be called to planet Earth right now. This is the last great missions thrust to go to the unevangelized areas of the world and reach them for the Lord Jesus Christ and to bring him glory. Are you excited about it? The end time church will be a church that will get the job done. If the early church was so successful that within a few generations, the then known world became professing Christian. Of course, through the sin of Constantine, who said that everybody born into the Roman Empire now is born a Christian. He rebelled against Jesus' statement where he said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, render to God what is God's. He rebelled, and we're still suffering from the harm that that did. Of course, people were grateful because it meant an end to persecution. But with persecution or without persecution, and probably with it, no, definitely with it. For some of these people going to these places will not come back. One-way tickets. Not because they'll just live the rest of their lives there, but because they'll live the rest of their lives there, which won't last very long. They will be martyred. I know that. I see it in the Spirit. But the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And if the early church was able to transform its generation for the glory of God, and that was a baby church, what will happen in the end time move of God when the mature church rises up under the anointing of Jesus Christ and preaches the gospel with signs and wonders and mighty demonstrations of the Holy Spirit? It will be a glorious season. I don't expect it will last very long. And it won't be that the whole world will be converted. For during that time, there'll be times of great darkness. Those who want to be wicked will be more wicked than ever before. Those who want to be righteous will be more glorious for God than ever before. We will shine. I remember Bible teacher Derek Prince asked the question, and they said, the way you teach, it sounds like some things are going to get better and better, and other things are going to get worse and worse. Well, what do you think about that? He said, it's very simple. I'm one of the things that are going to get better and better. In other words, yes, in the end times, there's going to be a huge falling away. In the end times, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be betrayal. There's going to be denial. There's going to be a godless society, a godless generation, and a world church, which is the church of Antichrist. Not the true church of Jesus Christ. But alongside those things, there's going to emerge the true church of Jesus Christ, believers who are growing up into Jesus Christ, not just individually, but corporately. A prophetic person upon this earth, the body of Christ, speaking the words of Jesus Christ to this generation under the end time anointing of the last days. And I pray to God that I shall be part of it. But if I'm not... 
And if this is not that last generation, we owe it to God. It is our responsibility to run with his agenda and to live in this generation and to move as far as we can forward into this growing outward and upward so that Jesus may be glorified and God would bring glory to himself by Christ Jesus. So this will only happen, of course, through a massive outpouring of the Spirit of God in the end times. God said it. He's going to do it. He is going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. He's promised to Abraham, in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We're going to see a mighty end time harvest. And the church of Jesus Christ will be ready to bring it in. Pray to God we take our part. Finally, there also in verse 13 of uh, Ephesians 4. It says, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ. Now you need to know what this means. You need to go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 and 23 because the word fullness has already appeared in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1 verses 22 to 23. And this is the final point in this series on the church, and I want you to go away with this, challenged and blessed. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we see Jesus Christ has been made head over all things, not just Believers, Jesus Christ has been made head over all things. All things are put beneath his feet. Now, God says, the headship of Jesus, and he is to be head over all things. That's God's plan for Jesus. He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Jesus Christ is Lord. So, the headship of Jesus over all things has been given by God as a gift to the church. And so the headship of Jesus is seen first of all in the church. When we submit to the lordship of Jesus, we are submitting to the lordship of the one who will reign supreme over all things in the future kingdom. But now, in this time, he is ruling and reigning in us, in our hearts. We are the community of the kingdom. The headship of Jesus has been given to us. He is the head and we are his body. And because we are his body, where does he live? Where do you live? I'm not talking about your address, your building. Where do you live? You live in your body. Isn't that right? If you don't live in your body, you are a weird person. Christ lives in his body. So here, Paul says, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in every way. The fullness of Christ fills all things. The universe is filled with the presence of Christ. But God has taken the presence of Christ and given the presence of Christ to the church as the first sphere of manifestation of the fullness of Christ. So the church carries the presence of Christ. Now Ephesians chapter 1 speaks about the position, the spiritual position. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's our spiritual position. Now Ephesians chapter 4 speaks about the outworking of that. The fullness of Christ means Christ dwells in the church. We know that's our spiritual experience. Spiritually speaking, Christ is amongst us. But Ephesians 4 is not just talking about a kind of spiritual notion or a spiritual fact. Ephesians 4 is talking about the outworking of the fact. In other words, Paul says there's coming a day when the fullness of Christ will be seen to be in the body of Christ, which will mean that it will be in that day exactly as if Jesus himself has come back and living and alive on planet Earth. Let me tell you, let me put it to you this way. Jesus is coming back in the church before he's coming back for the church. 
Jesus is going to manifest his presence so fully in the body of Christ that when the world points to the church, the world will be able to point and say, that's Jesus working. They will see him in us. Do you know what this means? It means everything that Jesus ministered in when he was on this earth will be fulfilled and ministered and manifested in the body of Christ. How did Jesus minister? Did he ever turn somebody away and say, I'm sorry, I'm only a disciple. I don't understand the will of God here. I'm sorry that you've not been healed. Did he ever do that? The only time he failed to heal was when they failed to believe. It was no failure in his part. It was a judgment of withholding healing from the stubborn and unpenitent. That's not to say today that when people aren't healed, it's because they're stubborn, unbelieving, and unpenitent. No, not at all. Often it's because we are mere disciples, that we haven't yet understood the workings of the Holy Spirit, that we don't know how to minister in the Holy Spirit. But the days are coming when the Spirit of God will be so manifesting the fullness of Christ, Christ's presence will be so fully manifested in his body that all who come to the church for help will be healed, will be delivered, will be set free. That's just in one element. But in every element of the manifestation of the body of Christ, of the fullness of Christ, the body will be experiencing that. And so, as we come to the very end of this series, Glory in the Church, we can see now how the Father will bring glory to his name by Christ Jesus in the church. And I call upon all of you, as we finish this course together, that you will pledge yourself and dedicate yourself to the work of Jesus Christ to be a church builder, to be an encourager, and that you would move out and to become the manifestation of God, or that God will use you to manifest his presence in this world and on this earth, and that together we'll grow up into Christ who is the head so that we might express his presence and his fullness to the world around us. God bless you. Let's do it in Jesus' name. Amen. And that brings to an end our teaching on the glory in the church. I pray that as you've watched and listened this series, God has given you a real revelation concerning who you are in Christ and what it means to be part of the wonderful church of Jesus Christ on this earth. We'll be back next time for another series on the Sword of the Spirit.